All right, you guys, it's Elevated here. Finally, finally coming at you with uh, Jainism 102. Um, so today's video is going to be over um, the metaphysics of karma, um, how it relates to our uh, state of bondage, and what leads to liberation. Um, just did another disclaimer. Um, like I said last time, I'm getting most of this information from this book um, by this Spanish scholar. Um, so at best it's maybe like secondary or even like tertiary, um, knowledge. I don't really, um, know any Jains in real life, so I can't really verify like the veracity of this book, but, um, um, looking at like all the other things I've researched, it pretty much seems to fall in line with everything I've studied. So, uh, we're good. <laughs> Um, so before we go into uh, Jainism, um, we're actually going to compare and contrast it to uh, Christianity or um, Abrahamic religions. Um, so we're just going to brush over these real quick. I'm pretty sure you all know this stuff. Um, so of course, humans have souls. Um, unworthy action or sin defiles the soul and leads to damnation slash hell. So things like pride, envy, wrath, sloth, avarice, or greed, gluttony, and lust. Um, where the action or virtue per, pu sorry, purifies the soul and leads to salvation or heaven. And those um, virtues are over here, humility, kindness, patience, diligence, temperance, abstinence, and chastity. Um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, sin generally equates to harm to others. Um, there are exceptions like um, um, pride, sloth. Gluttony, those tend to be more like self-harm, but like even like gluttony can be seen as um, harm to others. If you're eating more than your fair share, you're cutting someone else off from the food they could have had. But yeah, um, there are also exceptions for self-defense, protecting the innocent and stuff like that. But we kind of touched upon those and why those aren't really true either in uh, the last video that we did. So yeah. Um, of course, you're judged by God in death, and this God, the Abrahamic God, um, being a merciful God, um, can actually, like, even if, um, let's say you didn't uh, do enough uh, virtuous things to overcome your sins, he can still, like, have mercy on you and still allow you into heaven, right? Um, too much sin leads to a negative judgment, obviously. Um, you can absolve, uh, absolve sins through actions, deeds, etc. Um... So yeah, that's pretty much Abraham. I'm pretty sure uh, most people already knew these basic um, principles. But yeah, now we're going to be looking at Jainistic metaphysics, uh, talking about karma. <laughs> and of course, uh, <laughs> the type of karma people think about karma, do good things and good things will come your way. Um, this is kind of true in a sense but this is not the ultimate like we're, we're gonna tear this down basically as we go through this um so yes humans have souls um this is like a more complicated more nuanced um interpretation but essentially like uh, for simplicity's sake yeah we can say humans have souls um similar to sin souls can be defiled by karma um, now this is a, a, an entire process. There's a whole like science behind it. Uh, basically, karma is a type of matter that's um, invited by the soul, um, invited into the soul by the soul, um, either through things like action or action plus intention or desire, um, depending on whatever interpretations you're um, reading. Um, so yeah, this process is called karmic inflow and the the karm the karma stuck to the soul is what leads to a state of bondage um so generally karma uh, equates to ignorance plus desire plus action um unlike sin now this is one of the big um there's two two really big um differences between jainism and like abrahamic religions so unlike sin karma is both positive and negative Whereas sin was just negative things like pride, gluttony, lust. Karma is like two sides of the same coin. Um, this is important uh, because 
karma, um, according to Jane's, leads to transmigration or heaven slash hell. Now, transmigration, there's a whole, um, a whole uh, entire process and other cosmology behind this as well. Um, so, for example, positive, uh, positive karma transmigrates you to a positive realm or a heaven. Um, negative karma trans transmigrates you to a negative realm or hell. So, kind of like um, sin and virtue. Um, however, um, the important point to make here is... Um, Unlike uh, Abrahamic religions where you're supposed to do good things and good things will come your way, that is entirely not true. Um, heaven does not equate to salvation. And this is the other really important distinction between uh, Jainism and Christianity. Um, so basically, um, we have this quote that kind of explains it. A shackle made of gold is as good as one made of iron for the purpose of chaining a man. Similarly, karma, whether good or bad, equally binds the jiva, and jiva roughly translates to soul. So, um, <clears throat> transmigration is actually the state of bondage, um, according to Jains. You transmigrate uh, because you have um, a certain quality of karma built up within your um, jiva. Um, so, yeah. Um, that's the main distinction is heaven does not equal salvation and um, you can kind of understand that because um, a transmigration to heaven is distinctly different from uh, liberation from the cycle or the wheel of transmigration. So salvation or liberation or any of these things is completely different than Abrahamic thought, which is, oh, we just got to get into heaven, right? So, um, oh yeah, I did want to say, uh, this is one thing that uh, atheists actually manage to get right. They tend to ask, like, a bunch of, like, really good questions, but then jump uh, completely 180 to the complete opposite wrong conclusions by it. <laughs> it's really funny. But yeah, they'll say stuff like, um, oh, um, religion is just a crutch. If you need to be um, threatened with hell and rewarded with a heaven um, just to do good, then are you really morally good? And um, that actually makes sense. Um, so, like, if your intention, your desire, remember, ignorance plus desire um, generally um, builds karma. So if your desire is to live life uh, just to be rewarded with heaven, with, with, okay, so like your typical, um, when, when someone says heaven, you know, they typically think of like um, worldly or material things. Uh, they say like everyone gets a mansion in heaven, you get to see all your family and all your loved ones, you can eat your favorite ice cream and candy and all this stuff, right? Well, guess what? That desire for worldly things is might lead you to a worldly heaven, but it does not lead to salvation. Um, so remember in the Bible it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. We talked about that last video. Um, so when you, if you're saying something like, I desire to go to heaven, that's you're, in, um, you're looking for an external, a worldly... Uh, liberation instead of looking within which is where your true liberation lies. liberation lies yeah so um we've got this other quote from the bible that actually kind of breaks this down too uh i think we talked about this last time as well um so what causes conflicts and quarrels among you don't they come from the passions at war within you you crave what you do not have you kill and covet but are unable to obtain it you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may squander it on your pleasures. So <laughs> basically, yeah, if you're, you're, you're desiring to go into heaven and get all this, um, like, um, you're just going to be overloaded with, like, serotonin or basically, um, that's not the... <laughs> It's not the salvation or the true liberation that Jains really seek. So yeah, um, true salvation or liberation or emancipation comes by purifying the soul of karma um, through like wisdom and non-attachment, not 
through um, gathering up as much positive karma as you can. Like Christianity, a typical way to get into heaven would be just to be as virtuous as possible. James, um, it actually, um, they believe that that's just uh, another way to get um, bonded. Again, like a shackle made of gold is as good as one made of iron. Um, also, unlike Abrahamic religions, uh, there is no God to judge in death. It's almost like purely mechanistic, so only the state of the soul upon death determines judgment. So basically what that means is only what your action... It's, it's only what you manage to accomplish in life that, that determines where you go in death. So... Um, that's another thing, like there's no like um, heavenly merciful God that's going to um, put mercy on you and say, you know what, you tried your best. Um, now, Jains are, it's an all or nothing type religion. So yeah, um, that's pretty much breaking down the difference between those two. And um, this actually, we're going to go back and look at Sid Siddhartha again, um, because... Um, they kind of mention this stuff as well. So um, just remember to take the river as like a metaphor for life. Um, so he's speaking to um, Vasudeva and Vasudeva replies, um, the river has taught me to listen. From it you will learn it as well. It knows everything, the river. Everything can be learned from it. See, you've already learned from the water too that it is good to strive downwards, to sink, to seek death. Um, You'll learn it, or perhaps you know it already. See, I'm no learned man. I have no special skill in speaking. I also have no special skill in thinking. All I'm able to do is listen and to be godly, and I have nothing. I have learned nothing else. If I was able to say and teach it, I might be a wise man. But like this, I am only a ferryman, and it is my task to ferry people across the river. Um... <coughs> So this is, this is interesting um, because this kind of goes against um, Abrahamic religions as well where they have like pros uh, proselytization where you're, it's kind of like an obligation to a Christian to try and save other people. Whereas he's sitting here and um, he's saying like all I'm able to do is listen and to be godly. He said if I was able to say and teach it I might be a wise man. Uh, but all, I'm, all I am is a ferryman, and it's my job to ferry people across the river. Um, so, like, even though he has learned all these things uh, from the river, and he could be, like, a whole, like, Buddha or something and, like, teach them, um, it's, not, it's not his place, because these people are just here for um, going across the ferry, or, go, sorry, going across the river. Um, so, yeah. So yeah, again, right here, uh, but more than Vasudeva could teach him, he was taught by the river. Incessantly, he learned from it. Most of all, he learned from it to listen, to pay close attention with a quiet heart, with a waiting, opened soul, without passion, without a wish, without judgment, without an opinion. And this kind of goes in line with the whole um, non-attachment or getting rid of desire. Um, uh, so you want to bring, uh, we want to bring back Desir Desiderata again. Uh, the opening sentence, uh, go placidly amid the noise and the haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. And again, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, uh, river of life, basically. Life is but a dream. Um, so yeah, that kind of falls in line with everything else. Let me see. If there's anything else I need to mention out of here. Nope, because we're going to go back and actually read out of the book itself. Um, so this is a little bit long, but we're going to make it through it. All right, this, this kind of goes into detail about everything we were just talking about, too. So um, in India, the capital sin as a word is very clearly ignorance. Ignorance is the mind trapped in a dual vision. A mind that considers that my thought is a consciousness separated from the objects. The illusory identification with my mind and my sensations um, produces the attachment to objects, in turn causing desire, 
um, or uh, violence, hate, negligence, greed. All that distorts emotional life. The result, dukkha. And I think I've explained this before. Dukkha kind of translates to um, just like the suffering in life. Um, so fortunately, all the renunciant movements agreed that ignorance and attachment could be eliminated thanks to effort and or gnosis. So, um, like, uh, like I mentioned before, um, it's not, it doesn't come through like, um, a heavenly mercy. It's, it's only through personal efforts and, uh, wisdom. So, um, continuing on, they kind of go into the whole, like, um, and this is, uh, I'm like kind of iffy about talking about this because so many people are just like, oh yeah, I know what that means. Like, <laughs> you just got to get rid of the ego, man. You remember that meme that I pulled up uh, where it was like, uh, I'm casting off my ego and you fall off and you hit your spiritual ego. Yeah, be really careful with that if you think you understand this. Um, you know, just, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, anyways, um, any kind of activity would be karmically neutral, um, as there is only one witness, not identified with any action, truly transpersonal. So this is the state that you're kind of reaching towards. Um, so that's where they talk about if there is no individual, there is no ego, no volition, no desire, nor is there any attachment. Um, so yeah, in one way or another, such as uh, Ramanas were trying to overcome karma, the driving force in the wheel of transmigration, because halting the cycle represented liberation from bondage. That is to say, from the condition of human suffering and rebirth. So in summary, the problem is ignorance plus desire equals unworthy action, which leads to transmigration. The answer, discrimination plus non-attachment, which leads to knowledge. Um, which leads to liberation. The goal would be the equivalent of restoring faculties darkened by egotistical and ignorance activity. That is to say, restoring the soul to its innate state. This is what in India is called enlightenment or awakening, the non-dual way of experiencing the world, excuse me, where there is no distinction between the knower, the known, and the knowledge, where pure consciousness or jiva simply is. Um, the realization of this form of experience, radically different to the common one, has been called solitude, extinction, emancipation, or liberation. Um, so yeah. So if there's a... Um, we'll just continue. So there's, um, if there's a concept which sums up the essence of the Jain message, it is non-violence. Um, so Mahavira says the two actions of an ignorant person, someone attached to the world, are possession and violence. The possession of or attachment to things is not bad in itself, but it is to the extent that obtaining possessions, material, emotional, social, inevitably leads to a harmful and violent attitude towards others. One cannot preserve wealth or possessions without harming others. And thus, all violent attitudes are more or less rooted in attitudes of attachment. Violence, possession, and attachment are the cause of all action which bind us to the world. Um, so I'm actually going to go into um, possession a little bit more when I talk about uh, love as well. But yeah, so basically what they're saying is if once you decide, once the, fir um, the first person to pick up something and say, hey, this is mine, like they come up with a concept of possession, all of a sudden it does two things. One, it automatically implies that everything else isn't yours and that everything else is up for grabs. And this inevitably leads to... Um, violence attachments. Um, so yeah, we're going to go into merit and demerit, which again, uh, karma, different from sin. The, these are both the positive and negative aspects. Um, so obviously not all actions have the same value or extent. There are worthy actions and unworthy actions. Giving water to someone who is thirsty is a worthy action. The same goes for speaking kindly, giving food to ascetics, and shelter to the needy. Killing life is something unworthy, the same as hating, lying, and stealing. The archetype of worthy action is nonviolence, 
compassion, respect, generosity, and caring. That of unworthy action is violence, hate, greed, aggressiveness. So basically, yeah, you, it's the um, sins and the virtues um, in Abrahamic religions. Um, so all this has very strong implications. Um, with good actions, one is building up one's general merit that will lead to an elevated rebirth. Whereas with evil deeds, one is conditioned to lower rebirths. Um, so among lay persons, it is merit and demerit or worthiness and unworthiness, which counts as uh, with this one is forging one's, sorry, as with this one is forging one's future existence. Um, to that lay person who has trust in Jainism, knowledge of its fundamental principles, I don't think I have to read that. Um, okay, yeah. So the formulation of worthy and unworthy actions um, only makes sense when a great body of lay persons come together to form part of the community. For many such, their religion is at bottom a question of generating good karma and securing a good rebirth. The parallel, parallelism with Buddhism and Hinduism is uh, very clear. So yeah. Like, like, um, like most people would assume, um, mo for uh, many lay people, um, they're only they're only trying to just get good karma and secure a good rebirth, um, which <laughs> it, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, we'll continue. Um, Uh, oh yeah, this is, uh, I kind of like interjected, interjected this uh, paragraph here too, because I wanted to talk about this. Contemporary Jainism accepts collective social and even national karma. Um, so this is why I never say it, like I'm uh, in a group or anything like that, um, because um, you, can, you can be karmically linked to groups that you claim to be a part of. So... Um, so yeah. And it's just another thing about lay people. Almost nobody bothers to look too deeply into the mechanisms and implications of the subject. Um, there is no attempt to prove whether the law can or cannot be empirically demonstrated. It's taken for granted. Um, so people just like like lay people nowadays. Um, people just like take it take it at face value. Um, so studying all this, the first thing that he writes, the first thing that one gathers is that whether the amount of merit or demerit is lesser or greater, all action leads to rebirth. Merit does not lead to liberation, but to a better rebirth. Uh, and okay, yeah, this quote was, was from Kunda Kunda. We did this one earlier. A shackle made of gold is as good as one made of iron for the purpose of chaining a man. Similarly, karma, whether good or bad, equally binds the jiva. So, although with worthy action one is presented with a brighter future, virtuous behavior alone can never lead to liberation. Um, that's a very important. I should have underlined that. But yeah. Um, here's what Jain Jainism is insistent in stating that all intentional action will bear its fruit, which will make us return to samsara or the wheel of transmigration. Um, the formulation of a law of causal dependence makes no sense without the proclaiming of an escape route from the swarm of causes and effects, without the pro proclamation of the possibility of realization of the unconditioned state or um, this, the um, state of liberation, basically. So yeah, that kind of breaks it down. Um, there, there are some things I want to say about this though. Like it's it, uh, taking the middle path and um, like trying not to gather good karma or bad karma. Like it's, it's not that, oh, you see someone getting beat up on the street and you're just going to be an innocent bystander. It's not that you're. It's it's not that you're not to do any good in this world. It's more like just doing, just doing any action with non-attachment to it. Um, so, like atheists say, um, what's 
how moral are you if you have to be rewarded with heaven and threatened with hell to do good? It's more like just do good without worrying about going to heaven or hell. Or like don't ex don't even like expect to or wish to go to heaven for doing good. Like <laughs> that's not the point, right? Um, I hope I explained that well enough. But yeah, so now we're going to actually get into like the, the whole like science of karma as well. And I really wish I had finished reading, um, what was those series called? Like the Golden Compass Trilogy, because they actually do talk about this a lot as well. I think I mentioned it in my American Gods video. But yeah, I've only read the uh, first two books, and I'm pretty sure the third one goes a lot deeper into this uh, subject. But anyways, um, we'll just learn it from Jainism, right? Um, so in Jainism, karmic matter moves freely sorry, moves around freely throughout the entire universe as if it were interstellar dust. I did uh, read this part, I think. Uh, this fine dust is indifferent, and it only becomes a precise type of karma when it interacts with a spiritual monad. When the soul acts, the surrounding karmic particles automatically infiltrate. This is what is called inflow. Um, so, yeah. Inflow is like the hole through which the karmic liquid or dust penetrates, like a magnet for the karmic dust drifting about the universe. Or, as Jane Masters like to say, the jiva seems like a vessel in distress with countless breaches that let in karmic water, and these have to be sealed by correct spiritual practice. On penetrating into the soul, the sub subtle matter resulting from action becomes a specific type of karma according to the nature of the action. So then they go into the sources of karma. So um, five types of activity or five doors which favor the entrance of karmic matter. Um, so the first is false belief, which means the belief in mistaken doctrines. The second is the lack of self-discipline, which must be interpreted as the attachment to worldly things, food, sexual pleasure, jewelry, and other material objects. And like I mentioned earlier, even the attachment to this idea of going to heaven, that's another worldly um, attachment. Even though it's not this world, you're still attached to like materialism, you know? Um, so yeah, the more indulgent one is with these objects, the more karmic matter infiltrates and sticks to the jiva. The third is laxity, which is moral weakness and lack of attention. Violent action is that which is in reality committed through negligence and carelessness. Um, and the fourth type of activity, and with that I doubt the one which carries the most weight, consists of the passionate activities themselves. Um, so in Umasvati's opinion, passion holds the key to bondage. Um, so by passions, Jains understand all types of desire and hate, usually expressed in the form of four very strong passionate activities. Anger, pride, deceit, and greed. Similar to, like I said, similar to sins, right? Um, passionate activity is nothing other than the expression of the sensation of an I, an ego, an agent who desires, who depends on things, or the very root of ignorance, which is the very root of ignorance, I should say. Um, hence the importance of dominating it. Um, so the fifth activity through which karmic material is infiltrated um, is the above mentioned mental, corporal, or verbal activity or union with worldly objects. Um, a spirit characterized by these activities is like a sticky body to which the corresponding karmic material will inevitably adhere. Only arduous asceticism is able to burn it and to dry its stickiness. So <laughs> I think that's really, I, that's one of the things about this life. It's like, it's, it just, it's the, the feeling about it. Like, it's just like the sluggish, like mud of being in this realm. Like, I don't think people understand that. Um, that's why I write things like the formless center seeks a new position and all this because it's just being, it's literally bondage. You're stuck. You're bonded. It's, it's disgusting. But yeah. Um, so <laughs> now we're going to get to uh, the way to how to purify the soul. Um, so instead of it just being a oh, virtuous action purifies, no, um, this is a lot different. Um, 
So to purify the soul and free it from the wheel of time, one would have to not only renounce ritual and social condition, but to undertake a greater sacrifice, that of the ego, that is, the world of attachment, desires, and ties. How could one attain the state of witness when attached to things? Until the persona is unmasked, its attention is only fixed on worldly and material things. In other words, in what the soul is not. So again, if you're thinking you're going to go to heaven and see all your loved ones and this and that, that's, that's not, <laughs> that's not, that's attachment to worldly things. That's not what the soul is. That's not what liberation is. So if you're still attached to being, you're not going to find liberation. Um, so yeah. Uh, as Jan he Heisterman has observed, it was not a matter of affirming or rejecting Vedic sacrifice, but in determining which was the authentic sacrifice. The Sramanas and the Brahmanas of the Upanishads all came to the conclusion that authentic sacrifice came from within. The exoteric rite cannot solve the problem of suffering, nescience, and human alienation. Only a greater sacrifice, the path of inner purification, could free us. Um, and then they go into like the several uh, ways of purifying the soul. Obviously, um, you have you have these um, kind of reflected throughout all world religions too. So uh, things like asceticism, um, living a, a monk's life, um, stuff like that. Dispossession, spiritual power, and the renunciatory nature of chastity were valued. Um, Mahavira established five major vows which all um, ascetics should comply with. Not to kill, not to lie, not to steal, have no possessions, and not to have sexual, excuse me, not to have sexual relations. Um, I don't know if this is... Another thing that you don't want to be attached to and this is this is like where it gets kind of dicey is like you also don't like like i said um if you're if you're trying to get into if you're if you're give me a sec the same mindset where it's like i'm going to do all these virtues and get into heaven um is there's a similar sentiment in Jainism where it's like you don't you don't want to be attached it's it's weird like you don't want to be attached to the idea of liberation either cuz that's also a form of like attachment to worldly things because you don't know what it is like i understand like there are people who are like yeah i did shrooms one time so i understand what enlightenment is like no, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, there's so many different, like, it's whatever, it's whatever. Anyways, we'll continue. Um, so whoever took these vows never to break them would be combating precisely the contrary actions which bind us to the world. Violence, lies, covetin covetousness, and material and sensual desire. Um, so yeah. Um, one thing to point out, I thought that was really interesting. Since prehistoric times, Indians have considered that ascetic pra practices generate such spiritual ardor or heat that the practitioner is capable of literally burning his or her bonds and passions. Oh, that'd be so nice. Um, so this fervor of spiritual ardor was produced by means of techniques such as breath retention, ingesting intoxicating substances, exposure to fire, exposure to the sun, etc. Um, in the case of the Jainas, the most frequently adopted practice was and still is fasting. But then again, as stated earlier, the ascetic way of life, guided by the five vows and precepts, is in itself an act of tapas. Um, Jain asceticism does not extend to eccentric practices or those consisting of ordeals, but rather involves care, control, rectitude, and exertion in all activities. Two ideas underlie these practices. Uh, number one, 
the transcending, um, the ego corporeal condition to meet with the spiritual condition. And uh, number two, literally burning away of passions and bonds with the aid of spiritual art are generated by pe penitence and strict contact. Um, but this heating would be futile, uh, futile without the control of the mind. To tapas, one must add the practice of concentration aimed at control of the mind. And this way, it can lead to absolute equanimity. Contemplative practice and ascetic practice must go hand in hand. So it's not just, um, there's, it's a multi-layered thing. Um, one thing I wanted to point out about this is um, eccentric practices right here. Um, so like obviously you have the, oh, starve yourself for so long, or the monks who do all this like really ridiculous and over-the-top spiritual um, asceticism. Um, one of the things that like uh, Mahavira and the Buddha and all these other people taught was like, um, you don't, you don't, like everything in moderation, including moderation, right? Like uh, if you're too focused on, on um, practicing this form of asceticism, then you're, you're, it's like you're too attached to it. You know what I mean? So um, that kind of comes into play with the whole, um, I don't know if this is true or not, I've heard it, but this kind of like does make a point. Um, so like Tantra or like the, the sexual Tantra type stuff, that was generally, um, I want to say that was introduced like um, during a time when uh, people were really trying to be abstinent or um, celibate and like really um, over overdoing the asceticism at that time. So all all that um, that was was trying to counterbalance the level of attachment these people had to this form of um, this form of work. Um, so things like that like aren't going to translate across time. So if you're in a time where um, like sexual um, um, desires are kind of like indulged, like obviously doing uh, Tantra is not going to help at all. You need, you want to do the opposite. Um, you kind of want to try and balance out. This is what they mean by middle path, basically. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not just this asceticism either. Like I said right here, you also have to do like... Um, um, self-control, self-discipline. I think they also mention like meditation and stuff like that as well. So yeah. Um, overall, the idea of progress in ancient India was clearly different to that of the modern world. It did not necessarily involve improving society, but attaining transcendental wisdom. This is the most, <laughs> this is one of the important things here. So unlike uh, Christianity, unlike other stuff where you're like, oh, I have to um, convert people and save as many souls as I can, their first and foremost priority was just gathering the wisdom. And this sounds kind of selfish, but like gathering the wisdom for themselves. Because you can't, you, you can't, <sighs> the only thing you have under your control is yourself so that's all you need to focus on if you're trying to focus on oh i want to save this other person because i want to see them in heaven it's like well one you're attached to them two you're attached to the idea to heaven this is that it's <laughs> desire again ignorance and um unworthy action that leads to transmigration so yeah um For many Indians, freedom is a search for oneself within oneself. Only improving what is truly essential can lead to progress in society. Emphasis is always put on personal enlightenment before any other social consideration. Excuse me. It is not a case of saving the personality, but of achieving absolute liberty. A freedom that requires sacrificing the human condition and personality. So again, if you think... <laughs> Uh, this formless self is going to heaven to hang out with all its fucking family and friends, and that's not the, that's not that's not full liberation. You're still attached. <sighs> so yeah, um, and then we'll go into this. Uh, this is actually kind of what I mentioned earlier. I didn't realize I had it later on. 
But yeah, um, so the path that Mahavira taught had to be strictly individual. Um, his ideal was of solitary heroes that venture into unpopulated territories, jungles, and mountaintops. Ancient Jainism convincingly insists that true sarmanas must reduce their contact with laity to a minimum. They cannot give sermons in return for food that is given by people in the world. Um, so yeah, this is the same thing. The thing. Well, first of all, you don't have to go into um, go live in the mountains or forests or caves to do this. Like <laughs> that's so. Like you can do the same thing, just living in society and doing whatever. You know, like just don't be attached to anything, basically. Um, uh, daily practice would not only include constant restrictions, generally fasting, but also mortification of the body. Ascetic life, as it appears in the first sex, was notable for its particularly harsh nature. Um, this rigorous ascetic path may seem exaggerated above all, uh, sorry, above all if we compare it with the Buddhist path. As readers may know, the Buddha proclaimed the middle way um, with a particular view to the extremes of self-indulgence. Um, as among the nihilists, and self-mortification typified by the Jains. Um, so this kind of goes against um, Jainism in this sense, but I would agree with this one more so than uh, the Jain Jainism style of oh, strict asceticism. you got to burn your attachments away by completely starving yourself. Like, eh. <laughs> Buddha had it more right than that uh, when he said that, um, well, um, if you're... If you're trying too hard to eat, like it's just it's it 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 fights back, like your body fights back, um, and it it causes more like suffering. Basically, it's like more distracting than anything, really. Um, um, however, um, seen from the Jain point of view, the Buddha weakened. He left the path of interior purification that combined tapas and dhyana to be content with meditation alone. Um, so this is where I would disagree with them because it's not just contemplation or meditation. There is a, a process of interior purification, um, among, um, other things, um, that have to be done in order. Uh, you, like, you can't just rely on, oh, I'm just going to sit down and meditate and, oh, look at me, um, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, so yeah, the, um, uh, Jainism eventually um, uh, changed along with Buddhism, uh, so the karmic quality of an act is decided by the intention and the internal states that accompanies it, and not by the deed itself. So this is another idea that came came about, um, which uh, really makes sense. So um, so I ate, they, they, this is where they break it down again too. Ancient Jainism is close to the ideal of a superhuman ascetic, absolutely detached from the world and concentrated on the permanent care and control of their actions. But such a model could not be very popular and would always depend on factors, circumstances, and accidents beyond the ascetic's control. Um, so this book kind of like what they do is they see that where it's like, oh, they steered away from ancient Jainism in this... Um, very strict asceticism to kind of like um, spread the popularity like they wanted it to make it easier for lay people um, in order for the religion to spread and that's kind of like a hypothesis that he came up with and I don't think that's entirely true I think they um, they actually discovered that these this like the strict asceticism isn't the way to do it um, but yeah so it's Kunda Kunda who takes the definitive step in stating that once ascetics realize their own spiritual nature, they cannot then be subject to bondage since they are only knowledge. Um, which I also disagree with too, because it's it's not just I'm I like fifty fifty disagree with this because um, yes, like wisdom. Um, kind of lets you see how the world is and kind of lets you detach from it but like you still have to go through the process of purifying the karma that you had um, developed um, to begin with so um, yeah this is this is definitely a lot different um, than like Christian the typical Christianity type um, thinking where it's like oh we have to save the world and do good and 
um, convert these people in order to bring everyone to heaven type stuff. But it's it's like you can see the relationships between this and um, religion as well. Or sorry, uh, Abrahamic religion. And let me see if I can pull up the Bible. See, where we're, we'll go through this again, um, and I'll I'll, sh I'll show you. So yeah, obviously, if you were of the world, it would love you as its own. It said the world hates you. Um, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. Um, Did I miss that? Hold on. Okay, I completely read that wrong. I thought that was something else. Never mind. We'll continue. Oh, you probably can't even see this, can you? Sorry about that. So yeah, this is where I disagree with religion, where it's like... Uh, there are false, many false prophets out there, um, and the only way to know is um, if they confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, and it's like, mm, mm, mm. that's not entirely true, but okay. Um, the, the spirit of the Antichrist is materialism, I would say, and again, if you're thinking of heaven as mansions and candy and family, that's all material, isn't it? Think. Come on. Um, so, yeah. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are of the world. This is why they speak from the world's perspective and the world listens to them. This is why... So many people will be like, yeah, I want to get into heaven and I'll do all this stuff for it. Crusades and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, you know history. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever's not from God does not listen to us. That is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. So yeah, if you're, if you're listening to me, if you're reading this and you understand it, great. You get it. Awesome. If you like, if you're listening to this and your first reaction is, ah, ah, that's so awful. That's completely against everything I've learned. And that you can't be right. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Spirit of deception. You've been deceived. Come on. Um, we already said this one earlier. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may squander it on your pleasures. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his heart and his religion is worthless. So that's another like self-discipline thing. But if you're sitting here and you're not bridling, and I'm pretty sure that means like holding it. Um, let's see. Yeah, basically means if you're not if you're not controlling having self-discipline on your tongue, um, you're deceiving your heart. You know, your 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 religion is worthless, basically. So if you're sitting here, you're one of those people like, oh, you need to, you need Jesus. Calm down. Pure and undefiled, this is in the Bible, by the way, not, not from Jainism. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It's never, this is why I disagree with uh, Jainism, where it's like, um, if you read Jainism and you're like, oh, you need to go the middle path and not uh, generate good karma, it's like, you can still do the actions, because remember, karma is action plus desire. So do the action, the good action, like he says here, care for the orphans and widows in their distress, but like, don't do it with attachment. Don't keep, keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Um, so yeah. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
then you'll be able to test and prove what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Um, that level of um, going back to that innate state of the soul that Janus talk about. So yeah. Think of yourself with sober judgment. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. If you think life itself is something that's going to uh, continue once you hit this like uh, liberation from bondage, life itself is a worldly thing, if you can understand that. Um, and that's kind of going to be like a little bit controversial to say, but it is what it is. You can't, you can't, you can't expect to be liberated from all this <laughs> and still hold on to the pride of life or thinking um, it's a salvation. What did he say? He said it at the end. Um... Sorry, I lost my... <laughs> Where was it? Yeah, right here. It is not a case of saving the personality, but achieving absolute liberty. A freedom that requires sacrificing the human condition and personality. If that does not sound just as similar as um, the pride of life, desires of the flesh, desire of the eyes, then we're not speaking the same language and you probably don't need to be on my channel. But it is what it is. So, whew, sorry this one took so long. Typically, typically... Um, I pretty much do um, do these things like um, like off the top of my head. This is something that I just came across um, recently. Um, so, like most of these topics that I talk about, I've de uh, developed over like years and years of study and contemplation. Um, but this one in particular, it was. Um, it's different, <laughs> I'll say that, but luckily it kind of goes hand in hand with everything I kind of like intuitively knew about like uh, Christianity as well. So it's really interesting to see those parallels. But yeah, that's, um, that's Jainism for you. That's um, how, to, um, how to live in the world but not be of the world, according to Jains. Um, so yeah, hopefully this one was pretty, um, pretty inspiring, pretty interesting for y'all. Um, but yeah, sorry it came out a month late, um, but we'll hopefully move on from that. Um, I should be able, it's the 17th now, I should be able to, um, what's it called? I should be able to finish my next two videos. Um, cause it's another poetry one. And then my next video for August will be on love and possession kind of attachment as well, I should say. But, um, that one's going to be more so like off the top of my head, uh, type stuff than a full presentation. Really. I'm just going to be rambling on that one <laughs> cause I could ramble for days about love and <laughs> all that, but it's whatever. Um, so yeah, hope to see you next time. Hope you enjoyed this one. Um, take it easy.